September the 28th, 2014, and you've joined us for the first service of the Weatherby, well actually it's Southwest Missouri House Church. We're, we're down in Southwest Missouri. Excuse my Buddy Holly glasses today. <laughs> it's the only glasses I have that I can see with. My other one's got to be... Uh, more trouble than they were worth, put it that way. Um, the first song we're going to sing is in the front of our books. And it's entitled A True Story. I'm going to switch this camera over to Mark and Rosette and see if we can get there on them. And they'll give me a few minutes on them, I guess. Rosette is that. Okay. <laughs> All right. This is a true story. There's a lot of messages out there in the uh, Christian church community at large that are absent of a big part of the gospel. We're going to uh, we're going to be talking today about. about the complete story. Paul Harvey used to say, you know, I'm going to tell you the rest of the story. So I guess that's what we're going to talk about this morning is the rest of the story. Looking back in history, we see events unfold. And the greatest story in history is the greatest story ever told. It is not just a novel. No, this story is true. How God sent His Son to die to redeem His chosen few. Praise and thanksgiving we give to the Son who in the courts of heaven with the three in one, made provision for the sinner, through his blood the work is done. The plan was determined between the Trinity, and this great story in history would be a certainty. God would redeem his people, a ransom he would pay. Christ would be slain on Calvary in history on that day. You see, Scripture tells us that He was slain in eternity before the world began. It was predetermined. Yes, it was His master plan. Praise and thanksgiving we give to the Son, who in the courts of heaven, with the three in one, made provision for the sinner, through his blood the work is done. Okay, the next one we're going to do, Rosette has chosen Psalm 16b, page 16, in the Psalter. The Psalms are good to sing because they are full of the gospel. Did you hear what I said? The Psalms are full of the gospel. About the Redeemer. About the Savior. About Christ Jesus. Yes, the Old Testament church uh, had the gospel. <laughs> looking forward to the coming of the Messiah who would come and give his life a ransom for his people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
For in you do I trust my soul to the Lord has said you are my Lord. No goodness have I beyond you and my joy I find in the godly the noble honor. Those worshiping other gods multiply griefs. I will not pour out their libations of blood. Nor will I upon my lips take up their names. The Lord's my inherited portion, my God. My lot you maintain, and the lion to me. In pleasant land I hope a good heritage. The Lord who gives counsel to me I will bless. My inmost self teaches me all through the night. The Lord ever present before me I keep. He stands at my right hand, I shall not be moved. My heart's glad, my soul joys, my flesh rests in hope. For you will not give up my soul to the grave. Your holy life I preserve from decay the pathway of life you will show unto me. In your glorious presence is fullness of joy. Your right hand hold pleasures for me evermore. Four thirty nine or noise fuel hymnal. Four hundred and thirty nine. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the world is tossing me like a ship upon the sea, those who rule us wind and water stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. In the midst of tribulation, stand by me. When the host of hell assail and my strength begins to fail, thou who never lost a battle, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. In the midst of faults and failures, stand by me. When I do the best I can, and my friends misunderstand, Thou who knowest all about me, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. In the midst of persecution, stand by me. When my foes in battle array, undertake to stop my way, the who say, Paul and Silas, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When I'm growing old and feeble, stand by me. When my life becomes a burden, and I'm nearing cheerly Jordan, O oh, thou lily of the valley, stand by me. Dear Lord, we pray that you would be with us in this service. We pray that you would take your word and that you would open it to us. Open our hearts to us and grant unto us your Holy Spirit to lead and guide and direct our thoughts, we pray. In Christ's name we pray, Amen. <clears throat> There's a, a great deal of uh, confusion regarding how to properly interpret the Bible. And a lot of that confusion comes from um, misguided theologians. And you might say, what do you mean by misguided? I'm saying that their motives are not Christ-centered. Their motives are earth-centered. They're thinking about they're thinking about this earth 
they're not thinking about eternity. When people start talking about the millennial reign and you know Christ setting up an earthly kingdom and um, the state of Israel and the restoration of the Jews and all of that the focus is on the wrong thing what should the what should the Christians focus be on the Christians focus should be on eternity mind not earthly things Christ said my kingdom is not of this world if my kingdom was this, was of this world I would tell my subjects to to fight but he told Peter put up thy sword those who live by the sword die by the sword and there's a lot of people here that are trying to set up an earthly kingdom take dominion over the earth and uh, make make uh, make the uh, earth Presbyterian Baptist Assembly of God Church of Christ uh, Church of God Holiness uh, uh, Pentecostal land <laughs> I don't want to go to any of those countries. I'm, not, I'm looking for a better country. I'm looking for the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven prepared for a bride. I heard a guy the other day make the statement that the uh, the uh, the Jews were merely a friend of the groom. <laughs> those who are chosen by God are merely a friend of the groom. They're not in the bride of Christ. Bogadash. Is that a word? Bogadash or something like that? Hogwash. <laughs> now, it all started, well it didn't, it all started when Satan said, I will rise and be as God. And that's really, uh, now Satan is a created being. He is a uh, non-elect being he wasn't elected to be in heaven for eternity with Michael and Gabriel he was uh, a non-elect entity and he fell and he took a third of his angels with him when he fell and we also know that God in his sovereignty uh, did not execute option B when Satan fell. Okay, God knew that Satan was going to fall before before he created Satan. God knew that Satan was going to fall before he created Satan. God knew that Judas was going to betray him before he created Judas. God hated Esau before he was born while he was yet in his mother's womb. God loved Jacob. He didn't just foreknow Jacob. <laughs> God loved Jacob while he was yet in his mother's womb before he had done any good or evil that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Now the dispensationalists teach a different doctrine. They teach that God works in seven different dispensations to give seven different tests to mankind to determine whether they pass the test or not. And uh, they fail the test, don't they? Man always fails the test. God always passes the test. There's only two um, people on the face of the earth that have any kind of uh, remarkable um, remar remarkable significance to redemption. Okay, and that is Adam and Christ. In Adam, all died. 
in Christ are all God's elect made alive. And that's where the dispensationalists miss the boat. They deny uh, the fifth chapter of Romans. They deny the doctrine of original sin. And they put man upon the throne. And they also try to orchestrate God's plan when God's plan was orchestrated before eternity. And all these people on the prophecy club and prophecy this and prophecy that think they have all the answers. They try to uh, give their interpretations, but you know what? God's the only one that has the answers. No man knoweth the time of his coming. Not even the angels in heaven. <laughs> and yet these prophets on the face of the earth want to go around and proclaim, you know, God's timetable. It's God's timetable, it's not your timetable. And when people start talking about the seven different tests, let us remember Adam failed the test which plunged all humanity into spiritual death. And Christ was the only one that could redeem mankind. And he chose all of his elect before the foundation of the world to be a recipient of his precious redeeming blood. Now, we're going to uh, look at a passage um, in the fifth chapter of First Thessalonians. Now, this is concerning Christ's second coming. Now the dispensationalist, I remember one of the uh, persons that I sat under for a number of years. He pastored a church in Old One Park, Kansas. His name was Omar Lee. He was a dispensationalist. In fact, he recommended that I read a book by, I think the guy's name was Marstow or Marlow or something. Anyway, the, the title of it was God's Strategy in Human History. And it was a bunch of heresy. First Thessalonians chapter 5. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child and they shall not escape but ye brethren are not in darkness that the day should overtake you as a thief you are all the children of light and of the children of the day we are not of the night nor of darkness therefore let us not sleep as do others but let us watch and be so, uh, sober for they that sleep sleep in the night and they that be drunken are drunk in the night but let us who are of the day, be of sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. The dispensationalists take away the central focus of the hope of salvation, like I said earlier, and put it on a millennial reign on this earth. I'm not interested in uh, this earth. I'm interested in the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. I don't want to be a part of this cursed world. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me through heaven's open door. I don't feel at home in this cursed world anymore. God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. The dispensationalist use that as a justification for a pre-tribulation rapture. It's not talking about 
tribulation here on earth is talking about the fact that he has not appointed us to wrath but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it's talking about. Let's keep things straight. Let's not take things out of context. Context. Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep we should live together with him. You know, I was talking to someone the other day and this, the question came up about soul sleep. I, I am so glad, I've said this many times, I'm so glad that when the thief on the cross came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, what did Jesus tell the thief on the cross? The thousand millennial year reign, you'll be with me. No. <laughs> After you go through purgatory, be tried by fire, you'll be with me. No. During the rapture, you'll be caught up to see me. No. None of that. This day, thou wilt be with me in paradise. If God saw fit to take Larry Phillips out of this life today, I believe with all my heart that this day I would be with Christ in paradise. I believe the Old Testament saints are with Christ in paradise. And that's another reason I'm glad that we have record of the transfiguration. Because we see that Moses, right? Isn't that right? Who was talking with Christ? <laughs> And what were they talking about? They were talking about the upcoming crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And Peter tried to set up three earthly, earthly tabernacles right here on earth for Elijah, Moses, and Christ. <laughs> and there was a booming voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. This is my message to all dispensationalists. Hear the beloved Son of Jesus Christ. Keep your mouth shut regarding all of these lies you're putting out, Darby, and Sperry Schaefer, and uh, Ryrie, and the Left Behind series, Hal Lindsey and the, all you Jesuit co and all you sympathizers of the Roman Catholic Church, shut up! <laughs> Listen to the beloved Son of God. Now, I'm going to go on down. It says in verse 10, Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another. This is a comfort to the believer to know that whether we sleep, in other words, whether we wake or sleep, we're going to be with Christ. <clears throat> now, he says here that in the 23rd verse and the very God of peace sanctify you holy and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ uh, now question we've got a question for uh, all of those who uh, want to promote this uh, dispensational theology and deny that there's one body, there's one faith, and there's one baptism, and that all have drunk of the same spiritual rock, and that rock is Christ Jesus. If you want to proclaim that the Jews do not have to trust in the Messiah as a redeemer for their sins to get to heaven, and you say they're going to be in a different section of heaven and they're never going to have any kind of uh, association with the body of Christ, then 
my question is, how are you different than the other cults out there? How are you different than the Mormon cult, who we know was influenced by the Jesuit priests? We know, we have record of that. We know Brigham Young was told by a Jesuit priest to pick up and move all of his stuff to Salt Lake City, Utah, and hundreds of his people died because the advice wasn't good. It was during the winter time. We know that the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church had a profound impact on the origin of the Muslim religion. We also know that there was a Jesuit influence upon Russell and we also know there's a Jesuit influence on not only the Jehovah's Witnesses but the Seventh-day Adventists and there's also been a Jesuit influence on the rapture theory. You say, how can you prove that? Well, you can do your own research, but the reason that the Jesuits were so profoundly against um, Orthodox Christian doctrine because it taught for uh, many, many years that the Roman Catholic Church in the Pope represented the Antichrist. And they wanted something in the future that would point away from the Roman Catholic Church. And the only way they could point it away is come up with this secret rapture theory and come up with something that was obliterous to the Roman Catholic Church as it relates to the final Antichrist. Now the Plymouth Brethren uh, had a tremendous impact on Darby. Darby came out of Anglicanism, the Church of England, and it's true that the Church of England had gone into apostasy and was primarily into dead orthodoxy, but at the same time, <clears throat> Darby jumped from the frying pan right into the fire when he jumped into this dispensational uh, hermeneutic because you translate the Bible totally different and you look at the Bible totally different and you take the Bible totally out of context when you deny one election the sovereignty of God in salvation the superlapsarian position the reality that Christ was slain from the foundation of the world the reality that God is the one that created Satan and that God is the one that has his own elect. God is the one who has fitted vessels of wrath, fitted for destruction, and he has created vessels of honor. And that God purposed before he created the world that Christ would come and die for his people. And we also see in Genesis that his gospel was revealed when he, when blood, blood was shed for the sin of Adam. Looking forward to the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You say, oh, you're into covenant theology. I'm into biblical theology. You can call it anything you want to call it. I'm quoting the Bible. You're taking the Bible out of context, Mr. Dispensationalist, John MacArthur. When you make statements about dispensational theology being biblical, it is not. God does not have seven different ways, and seven, seven different uh, ways for God, God to, to reveal himself to people. He reveals himself to his elect through his son Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit regenerating their hearts like he told Nicodemus in John 3. You must be born again. The Spirit bloweth where it listeth and no man knoweth the sound thereof. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit of God. So forget all of your preoccupation with prophecy 
I don't despise prophesying. It says despise not prophesying. If it's true prophecy, if, the, if it's prophetic utterances from the Bible, but when you take the Bible out of context and you start portraying a false Christ only because you're upholding Loyola and his counter-reformation, then I have no use for you. And I will speak out against it. So that's the message for this morning. Do we have a, a selection as we conclude this service? It was with an everlasting love. It's taken from the um, old school hymnal. And it's 117. I'm sorry, 417. And um, I want to, before we sing this, I'm going to read this. It was with an everlasting love that God his own elect embraced before he made the worlds above or earth on her huge columns placed. Long ere the sun's refulgent rays, primeval shades of darkness drove, they on his sacred bosom lay, loved with an everlasting love. Then in his love and his decrees, Christ and his bride appeared as one. Her sin by imputation his, while she in spotless splendor shone. O oh, love, how high thy glory swell, how great, immutable, and, and free. Ten thousand sins as black as hell are swallowed up, O oh, love, by thee. Believer, here thy comfort stands, from first to last salvation's free, and everlasting love demands an everlasting song from thee. <clears throat> I'm going to switch the camera back over to uh, okay. Okay. Was with an everlasting love that God his own elect embraced before he made the worlds above earth on her huge columns placed long ere the sun's refulgent ray primeval shades of darkness drove they on his sacred bosom lay, love with an everlasting love. Then in his love and his decrees, Christ and his bride appeared as one. Her sin by imputation his, while she in spotless splendor shone. O oh, love, how high thy glory swell, how great, immutable, and free. Ten thousand sins as black as hell are swallowed up, O oh, love, by thee. Believer, here thy comfort stands from first to last salvation's free. An everlasting love demands an everlasting song from thee. Dear Lord, we're thankful for the word of God we pray today in our hearts as Christians we pray. Christian. Amen. Father, we're thankful that we can rely upon the truth of your word and we don't have to change it. We don't have to make it up as we go. We can stand on the solid truths of your word. Pray that you will take this message and use it for your glory, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.